Yeah, it looks like we're live. Awesome. Okay, so resuming, I dived into the Ethereum code base, specifically the Go Ethereum code base. Okay. Um, yes, I sort of looked at uh, the transactions that are in a block. Um, I kind of pointed out the blockchain.go file and said I might look at that, but I opened that one up later and it was 1,500 lines and a little deeper than I want to go right now. Um, so the thing I'm going to look at is the state and specifically um, this account state. So the way that Ethereum and get, um, where is it, in core um, state. Uh, the way that Ethereum stores it is that every transaction affects this concept of the state of the blockchain. Um, and the state is essentially a big list of all the accounts and how much money they have in their accounts and also they've got a storage so they got some memory there for everything and this primarily really relates to contracts so each contract will have um, some memory that it's saved to and it's got its data and um, it's got like all the stack and all that sort of stuff for the contract gets saved in this storage on the state. So the way it does it, uh, actually I want to go back, da -da, da -da. Tima. City core, core state. state dot go what dm state db dot go ah oh, god this is not working cool got there that was hard so this is the state <laughs> which is just wrapping the database where it gets stored so they've passed in what would be the level database and the tree where it's all going um, and it's a map of common addresses to state objects. Um, this is just taken out of the tree because navigating a tree is a bit of a pain in the ass so they've pulled it out here just so that you've got a nice easy way to find what you want in a mapping that Go does. Um, I'm not going to look at this whole file today I'm going to specifically look at the state objects. So, um, state object go. This one. And yeah, so every transaction affects the state. And the state is just a data structure that has every account um, that's ever been modified on the Ethereum blockchain. And in it, it's got the balance and storage plus some other things. The state is stored in this modified Merkle Patricia tree, um, which is a thing that Ethereum made. Um, Vitalik has mentioned that that is his favorite data structure which it is pretty amazing. It's sort of like um, you can save and traverse it and modify it um, quickly given the fact that you need to be able to go back in time and see any previous versions of the state. So you got a block that's 10 blocks ago using the state, you can still see what it was back then. And every time it gets updated, it keeps the information that was previously there. Um, to a certain extent, 
they then prune it after a while um, just to keep the size down. Um, yeah, but it's a mapping between addresses and account states. And this is what we're going to look at, the account states. Um, the addresses in this account uh, instance are hashes of the Merkle tree, Merkle Patricia tree below it. And it's traversing a, um, a hash and each path down the hash um, leads you to an address. Uh, I'm not fully up to date on that. I hopefully will be and that's why I'm not looking at that one right now. Um, and that's why I'm looking at the account state object, which is this sigma account. Um, which says it has the following four fields, a nonce, the balance, the storage group, and a code hash. Um, so, if we look at our file here where that is all kept, under package state, Right up, we got some generic empty code hash. Um, so they do a hash of nil. Because this code hash is what's kept in the account state here. And if it's just an account and not a contract, it doesn't have code. So you need that nil quite a lot, I imagine. Um, code set up a blank one um, and then given the option to return itself as a string disassemble self strings join disassemble self add spaces maybe not all right so that's commented out um, storage straight away mapping from a hash to a hash so, again, not sure where that's going to go right now. I'm assuming it relates to this storage route, which is a 25-bit, 256-bit hash um, that encodes the storage contents of an account to integer values. So that was what I was expecting. So I don't know why that common hash is to common hash at this point. We will see. Um, might be a hash to how you navigate the next tree because this is a tree as well um, and then they've got the two string undo so they've got this storage data type which is going to be used later I guess um, and they give you a string and a copy to be able to copy um, deep copies, I guess, and also to return it as a the key, the value, blah. They go through every key and value. Cool. So now that does at this point. And the storage object. Here we go. So the stuff at the start usually is just like set up boring code that's not really useful, and we get right into the meat of it, which is this state object structure. First, you need to obtain a state object. <laughs> um, account values can be addressed and modified through the object. Um, modified through the object. So it's got the address which is the address that's being looked at. Um, the hash of the account. Address hash. So they hash the address. Cool. They've got the data, which is an account, and they got the state database. Cool. So this is just wrapping 
this account structure, which we'll probably find below. Um, because it's just giving you the name of the address, the hash of the address, which are just probably like searching. So when you got a huge array of these state objects, actually with a um, a mapping in the higher up level. So they took it out of the tree and put it into a mapping so it's easy to use. And you have the hash or the address, one or the other, can't remember. What is it? What was it? Um, state DB. It's a mapping between an address and a state object. So they take this address, make it map to this whole structure. Um, and they got a copy of the database, which is a um, level DB database as well. For the state only. Um, they got a tree for the storage. Um, they've got the code in here and they got um, some other garbage that's for when you're writing and updating it. So if it's dirty, the storage needs updating, they need to flush the disk and stuff, yeah, blah. Dirty code, suicided, deleted, true, false. Um, so when they check it, they can say, is this dirty? Does this need updating? Blah. And also keeping the database errors because the blockchain doesn't. Um, this object here is probably what gets interacted more because they actually give you the storage tree and the code in this data structure itself. Whereas the theoretical state as defined here in the yellow paper has just the storage root and the hash. So it doesn't actually keep the stuff in here. Um, they call it the ephemeral, ephemeral um, state of the blockchain because it changes. Um, is this, it's got the balance which is, can change and the storage route which can change and this code hash. But you know what, that's useless when you're trying to analyze stuff. You want the actual data that's out there at this current point in time. So this state gives you the tree and the code. So there's the storage, that's the code that's in the contract. Um, and that's the storage that the code has created. And down, we're going to go through a little bit here. Here's some, here's the empty. Um, if the nonce equals zero and the, da and the balance equals zero and the code hash and the empty code hash are equal, they're saying this account is considered empty. And this, I think, was a big deal. Um, it's like Snapdragon fork, uh, maybe, I think that was called Ethereum. For some dude, he didn't hack so much as he like denial of service to the Ethereum block. Spurious Dragon, hard fork number four. Um, blah, 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 why are we proposing? Um, yeah, they had some denial of service attacks. Um, deep below. Um, yeah, so what happened was this guy found out that if you have a contract that commits suicide, which is like this, I believe. I'm not fully sure what the suicide means, actually. This is what I'm going to dig in later. But if you do something in the code and it suicides, um, you can create another account that is saved on the state and you can do that without it costing any gas or minimal gas and he used that and spammed it and ended up creating like 19 million uh, accounts that got saved on state and they were all empty and you know they all take up um, you know maybe a uh, a dozen bytes or so of emptiness, you know, it's just got the, however an empty 
account is saved when it's put in its recursive link prefix sort of form and times 19 million, which turned out to be like gigabytes. So, um, and it was chewing up the transactions in the, um, in the blocks so you couldn't get anything onto the chain. Uh, bloated the state, it was not good. So they put a lot of effort, and I think that's what this is, is testing whether it's considered empty. Cool. So, the Ethereum consensus representation of accounts. These are stored in the main tree. Nonce balance root code hash. <laughs> exactly word for word. What is in this yellow paper? Nonce balance storage root code hash. So the nonce details how many transactions have been performed by this account. Um, scalar value, not multi dimensional. The number of transactions sent from this address, um, the na or the number of contract creations made by this account. Um, so this is that replay attack effort they go to. Um, when you submit a transaction, you say what nonce it is. If it doesn't match up to what's this nonce in the state, then it gets rejected. Um, it's like writing a check. You got a checkbook, they go in order. If you write out of order, you can do that in real life. You can write checks out of order. But back in the day when big companies used to use checks and stuff, you know, the auditors would go through the checkbook and they'd say, why is this check missing? And that was kind of how you detected if someone was stealing checks because you'd know where they went. And anyway, um, Keep them in order, the check number in order, and you'll be able to keep track of everything that's going on. And there's no replay attacks in this case. There's no one spending money that they shouldn't have because um, they're copying and pasting someone else's code. The balance. How many we is in there? We? Why? How do you pronounce that? How to pronounce we Ethereum? How do you pronounce it? We. Way. The same as way. When we say we. They all say way. It's pronounced like way. <laughs> way die. <laughs> Accent marks mean nothing to English. It's way. How's this pronounced? Didn't help me because my headphones are on. Great. Way. Way. Cool. Way. That's how you pronounce it. Way. So, value equals the number of way owned by this address. Big integer. Number of way owned by this address. Cool. Simple, straightforward. Um, root, common hash. This is a storage tree, this one here. 256-bit hash of the root node of another Merkle tree that encodes the storage, which is a map in between 256 and that. Um, Keck hash to a 256-bit integer keys of 256 keys to the recursive like prefix encoded integer values denoted as sigma account s. Um, so this is a tree within a tree. So you've got your state tree. I wonder if I can get an actual... Merkle tree, a wiki 
page, which I have like a pretty picture of something. Here we go. Cool. So you got the top hash. And the state has the tree and you navigate it down and you get to the very bottom and you have the leaf nodes. And the leaf nodes in this case are the state objects, which are these accounts, theoretically in the paper, um, in the system they save them as a actual file that's got the actual data and not just mathematical representations of it. But you navigate, you get the storage root, which is in not storage root, the state root hash, um, Ethereum block. Explorer and the scan and if you go into a block transaction block height this top block has a hmm, uncle's mine transactions where's the storage state. It's not there. This is useless. It gives me it's not there. Extra data. Chinese data. Block reward. Uncle's reward. Gas used. Total mined by Shah Hank Uncle's parent hash hash. Nope. No good to me. Oh, no, this is terrible. Maybe it was there and I wasn't looking. ETH stats. So in it, network status, active node, uh, full count, block. Still weird. No. Okay, cool. So in a block, at which I can sort of see here, da, 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 block stop go. In the block, they get saved. No, that's not it. Where's my blocks? Up, types, block. They, that's another one where they save. They have in the header, Here, the root, which is the state root hash. That is what is at the top of this top hash. So every block says the top hash. That's all it keeps in it, the hash of the tree. Using that, you can rebuild the actual tree. Or better yet, you can verify a tree and make sure that it is. And... You go down the nodes till you get to the leaf down the bottom, and that is an example of the state object that they've got here. And in a sort of um, recursive nature, they put another common hash, which is the root, another one of these, to the storage tree. So another tree within a tree, and using that one, you can navigate down to what is the memory locations and what is saved in the memory. Um, and in one of these, they talk about it. Um, yeah, it ends up with all the stuff that's stored. So you have a contract, integers, bytes, they get stored when you do this in the storage tree. Um, you know, get storage at using the JavaScript module, you can go through with it. So it's a tree within a tree. Tree within, tri they spell it differently. Try within, uh, try, tree. <laughs> um, for the storage of a contract. And if it's not a contract, this is gonna be nil. And this, is a hash of the code. 
again, they don't keep the code, they just get a hash of it, and that's what's saved in this state. But then you have to keep the actual code to the side. Um, a lot of what they do is lossy, if you think they like, they lose information, but they can verify other, they can verify that the code is right by checking the hash. Um, again, this should be nil if it's an account. New object does the fun thing of taking a database, the address, and the data of the account, and creating the state object, which does nothing. It just takes it, splits it into it, makes an empty storage for these guys, because they, when you're working with it, you can um, invalidate the data, and you have to update it and stuff. Um, so they do a hash of the address, so you only have to pass the address, you don't have to pass the hash of the address, and they put the data in it. So it just gives you what you want. Um, if the balance equals nil, creates a zero. If code hash equals nil, um, empty code hash. Data.balance. So you've got to create a data file anyway, somehow. Um, encoding RLP and setting the error. So, this state object as it is, I don't think that's actually what gets stored in the tree. Um, it's that data structure, which is here, is what gets actually stored as an RLP encoding in this tree. And our yellow paper sort of says this as well. Um, though this is not stored on the blockchain, it is assumed that this implementation will maintain the mapping in a tree, um, simple database backend that takes a byte array to byte array, blah. Um, the root node is cryptic, blah, immutable data structure. Can have, since we store all root hashes, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, here we go. It's a mapping between addresses and account states, which is a data structure serializes RLP. So, the yellow paper specifically says, this is stored, serialized as RLP. Theorist concept, this is stored in the main tree. This other one, down here, they have the option to encode it in RLP for the state object, but that's not actually what gets stored in the tree. Um, that's stored elsewhere. So it's kind of funny because the blockchain is a data structure and then they say that the blockchain references this other data structure, I mean the state tree, which has all this data in it. But the state tree also references all this other data, such as the actual code itself, which is not stored in either of those. Um, actually, the code itself is stored in the transactions of the blockchain, so that's probably why. Um, So, yeah, new object, encoded in recursive length prefix, set error, um, so this just gives you the option to make an error, so when something goes wrong, um, If you've got, it's, it's mostly database fails, I think. So when you've got a database fail um, on a blockchain, you don't want it aggressively shutting everything down. You want it to set an error and then let you call that error later. So, you know, you got the state object set error, which you can't call externally. It's an internal function. And you pass it an error and it puts it into this db error. 
but only if it's nil. If it's already had an error, it won't do it. So it only remembers the first. If you put a second error, it won't remember it. It'll ignore it and it'll fail. Well, not fail, but it'll quietly do nothing. Mark suicided. So let's find out exactly what a suicided account. <laughs> Ethereum suicided. Post suicide. Why are self why are self destruction? How can a contract destroy other contract? Um, no, that's not really it. I'm reading bits and pieces that self-destruct with contracts is a good thing. Some explain what are the benefits to a contract self-destruct when it comes to Ethereum programming. It's an opcode? Cool. So you can call an opcode at the virtual machine level. Um, self-destruct address. This is useful when you're finished with a contract because it costs far less gas than to send in the balance. Cool. So it sends all the balance in um, your contract to another address and self-destructs. And then it just marks. A suicide opcode, which has become the self-destruct in the meantime, as per Ethereum information, something, EIP6. Change your name to suicide with self-destruct. Mental health is a very, okay, well, very good, very good. Very good, very good. Self-destruct. Um, so once you've self-destructed, Um, the account code part is deleted, but the address is still there, so you can execute a transaction. If you send Ether to it, you lose it. It's gone. So, um, there's an opcode. You have the option to call, which self-destructs. Um, used to be named suicide but they renamed that because uh, mental health is um, a key concern but they didn't change it here unfortunately because no one reads the actual code um, and that just sets it as true and once that's done if you send any ether to that contract it's gone it's lost it's burnt touch and touch is just a way of uh, just saying that the, now the address is dirty or well, the cache is dirty, so it's out of date and it needs updating. So all this one is doing is just marking the address in the state as dirty and it needs updating. So you, you need to go through the transactions and update the state for this object. And that is just, I guess, when you do first checks over, you look at stuff. Maybe you go through all the transactions and you say, these are affecting these accounts. And you mark them all as dirty. And then later on down the track, you go through that list of the dirty objects and you have to update them. Get the tree out of the database. And it returns a tree. So database open storage tree. If the tree equals nil. <laughs> so what this is saying is it only works if the state object's tree is nil. If error is not error. So, 
it gets the data root, which is the root address of the storage state object. Yeah, so the storage tree, it opens up the whole, and it gets the whole, hmm, I think I need to look at database. MMTG. storage tree ack all right this I think is chewing up um, open storage tree um, you got an iterator state object database core state database Core state database <laughs> open storage tree storage interface. Oh no. Yep, 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 okay, okay, cool. New secure. Uh, this is digging into the database structure. And this is what I don't understand yet. I don't know if the storage tree is saved in the um, the Merkle tree of the state database or if it's got its own database. So you've got level database is the database that holds everything. And then they've got over here, they've got one that's for uh, the transactions and they've got a state and then they've got the receipts. And I'm assuming in this state is also the stuff for the storage tree. So I believe that's the case. I will have to verify that though. So um, the data root opens it up. If they get an error, it means it doesn't exist, so they create it. So the new storage for a contract would have been created. And they return that tree. But I also set it internally as well. Get state retrieves a value from the account storage tree. So it goes into the database with a hash. The sturdy return value. So this is just self dot get committed state, which is this function here, which takes a database and takes a key. And I'm guessing. So first of all, it checks if it's got it saved. It's got it cached somewhere. If not, it'll actually go into the tree. And I guess navigating the tree is a little bit more painful than just doing a lookup on an array, especially if it's a small array. So it just calls this get committed state, which retrieves the value from the storage tree. Um, self dot get tree database try get key. <laughs> now, Ethereum defines the tree structure in another file and you pass it this key and this key represents the path in this Merkle tree. So 
the key is it going down? So the key is a list of um, ASCII characters, right? And those ASCII characters are encoded in hex. And the way it works is each hex for the ASCII encoding of the key is a path down the tree. And once it gets to the bottom. So what this does is it will try, get, and it will navigate and follow the key all the way down to the node that it's wanting. And that will re be returned. Um, if it gives an error, it sets the error, which is what they're talking about above. Um, if the length of the encoding is greater than zero, um, they decode it because it's um, encoded in recursive length prefix at this point. So you've got to un put it into something useful. Um, then, the, then you've got the bytes. set the bytes in content. So you decode that from RLP, which is what you got out of the tree database. For the storage, this is all relating to the storage and not the actual navigating the state, which I believe is the only one above it. Um, decodes it, gets the bytes, the origin storage key equals value self-origin storage um, so up here in the wrapper structure not in the actual ethereum defined structure not this one the one above it origin storage they store it here so it's um that's what this storage thing is, which is a mapping of hashes to hashes. Uh, it just returned a byte array. I'm not sure why it, again, this is where I said it was integers. Now it's a byte array. Um, Cause this here says storage. I guess a byte array can go to anything. Um, cool. So the value equals set bytes. Value equals origin storage key. If we have that cached, we already return it. If not, um, And actually go and find it so it is a hash so that would return a hash um, not sure we'll have to dig into that later as well on the big list of things we're doing later um, set state updates a value in the account storage so this is doing the exact opposite um, it would take the database key value and puts it in there self dot get state um, if it's the same as the old, don't do anything. So it calls the this function, searches for it. If it's the same, do nothing. If it's different, and this journal is new, I've seen them talk about that before. Um, they are changing the state object. So the storage change, account key pre value self.database.journal. So this is something Ethereum and Go Ethereum has defined um, in another file. Um, I think it's just their method for updating a database because um, you want to pass a list of things that you're going to update the database with and it's not going to update them immediately but you just have that list of how the database is being changed to the side and like sets up a a queue of transactions that are going to be changing the database rather than changing it immediately. And to make sure everyone's on the same page, is my understanding at this point. Um, set state. 
So this calls this one straight away, and this just straight away updates the dirty storage. So this is just quick local stuff. This, I believe, is making sure everyone on the P2P network is in sync. The update tree writes the cache storage modifications into the object storage tree. So it's, this is going to go through all the dirty objects. So it's going to iterate over the dirty storage. So when you're setting your dirty storage in here, um, it just gives another layer so that things can be updated in an orderly fashion rather than everyone and anyone having access to the database and writing to it. Um, and that kind of comes key when there's lots of cores on the computer doing stuff. Um, also, if there's lots of um, peers on the network. And it's just like, the more people that are involved, the harder it is to update a database consistently and making sure everyone has the same one. So they do things like, you don't update it unless you have permission. Um, and this is where those permissions are being. Um, it, so that you make a journal, you request a journal or something. I, like, I haven't dug into that yet. And you set this dirty storage. So you're saying, I'm going to be updating it myself. And even the computer's making sure it's coordinating the cores to um, update everything in an orderly fashion. And this will get called less frequently than that will. So you update the tree. You get the tree out of the database. Um, you go through every item in the dirty storage, which is um, you're trying to update the tree with the dirty storage. You skip no op changes, persist actual changes. If the value self origin storage So this is just a check in that oh, what you've been what's been put in this dirty storage is actually different to than what's in the real storage. Um, continue so it breaks out of the loop here if it is true. Um, the value gets set there. If the value equals a nil hash. You hash it for nothing. You delete it. And this is probably where my understanding at the moment is a bit weak. Because I think it's not actually putting data into it. It's putting hashes of data. Um, I'm not sure why, but we'll probably figure out that in a little bit. Um, if it is the hash of a nothing, it sets an error and then it tries to delete um, that key out of the database. Encoding the array of bytes cannot fail, okay to ignore the error. So this is a common convention in Go. Um, a function returns two items, a value and an error. And what it ends up is you get, um, I can't see any immediately in this code here, but you get a lot of if errors does not equal nil, blah. It's like here, if this error and it fails. Um, so underscore means ignore, so they ignore the error and that's what they're referring to here. They say if this encoding cannot fail, um, it is okay to ignore. Uh, RLP, encode to bytes, trim left. So they take the value Make sure it's got no garbage in front of it. Um, this is a trick to return the slice instead of an array. Um, it's probably, I don't fully understand the advantage of doing that, but Go people recommend that a lot. This is me learning as well. Um, encoding it to bytes, but you get the value. Um, self set error tree, try to update the key with the value. Origin storage key. 
equals value. Try update a tree. So they're keeping up in this other one. Uh, they're keeping the tree. They're keeping an array of objects that need updating in the tree, and they're keeping a, a cache as well. So they're keeping like three versions, which is interesting. You got your storage, you got your origin storage, so your dirty storage. These still need to be written to disk. These are the original entries to ddup rewrites. Don't know what ddup means. Ddup. Data deduplication. Eliminating duplicated copies. Yeah. So they got the the storage tree here and some storage items here which are extracts from the actual tree. Um, update storage. It, but pretty much the name says what it's going to do. It's going to go into the tree and it's going to write everything that we've got cached and needs to update the tree. Um, in regards to a storage tree again. So this is when a, a contract actually updates its storage. So when you've got a um, you've got a call or something in here, you're saying that the address here is updated to dev1 and you want to put that so it's already got a value in the storage and it needs to be updated. Update root. So once everything's been updated in the database, the Merkle tree changes again because these are hashes. So this bottom one is the hash of the actual data. This is a hash of the two branches. This is a hash of the two branches. Um, in a Merkle tree, there's 17 branches, not two, um, which is one for every uh, 16 for every value that a byte can take. Um, so once you update something here, this hash changes, and a result this hash changes, and a result this hash changes. These ones don't, um, these all stay the same, but everything above it changes. Up to the, the root of the tree. And that's kind of how it keeps the previous history, is that you've still got the old hash, and the old data's there. You got the new data over here, and then just this ref references a different piece of data rather than that. So you can keep the old hash and you can traverse the old hash, but you've got this new one when you update it. And that's kind of what, there's pictures floating around. Um, Merkle tree pruning. And they always show this picture, which is not in that one, so they didn't always show it. Um, Nope. And all of its outputs have been spent. Yeah. So yeah, you've got your tree. This doesn't actually ever change. But if this gets updated, they create a new data structure over here and they take the hash of it. So it creates another one of these over here. And then they do a hash of for this one using this and this new one, getting rid of that. And that lives over here. And then this root has a hash over here and here. So what ends up happening is you've got this top one and it references this new structure. You've got this old one, which is the old top, it references this. And you keep the history and you keep the new ones. Um, so, and that's what they talk about when they're pruning it because that obviously grows the database exponentially. 
every everything gets saved. Therefore, the millions and millions of accounts get saved, and all their updates are saved. And yeah, not great. So they prune it, which means that when some of these are never going to be used again, they delete it. And I think they try to keep the state under X amount of gigabytes. I'm not sure happening. Three rings a bell. Three or four rings a bell. Um, so you update the root. So once you've made some changes, the root changes and you update it and you set the root to this new hash. Which effectively means is now you've got the more up-to-date tree. And if you want to navigate it, you navigate the new tree instead of the old one. This is the storage tree. <laughs> Again, this is all in regards to the storage of a contract. Um, storage tree object to database. This updates the tree root. Self.tree got commit. So I guess these functions up here, commit tree, update tree, which we were talking about before, they've got the old go only export stuff with capital letters, same here, not a capital. So you can define internal and external functions for in Go depending on if it's got a capital or not. So this one's got the capital. All it's doing is um, safely checking when it does these updates. Because the other one doesn't actually check the errors, whereas this does error checking. It just saves it into this self.database error. So it, they're doing this stuff so it's safe for external calls. And by external, it's external to the package. Um, add balance. Removes amount from C's balance. Um, so this is in the context of you're adding the balance to someone else. So it's coming out of your account. Um, to the destination account of a transfer. I think that's a typo. Add balance removes an amount from C's balance. Sub balance removes an amount from C's balance. That add balance adds an amount. Probably irrelevant. So this actually goes into um, and adds to your state objects balance. Um, EIP 158. I think that's actually what we had up before. Um, EIP 158, that's not there, EIP 158, state clearing, no, 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 that one, um, so this is where we're saying, if everything's block number is above block number, made by Vidly, um, checking it, that if an account is now zero, it is deleted. And this is them touching. If an address is touched, then they have to check that it's 
not an empty balance, and if it is, delete it. A large number of empty accounts, which has been put in there at very low cost due to flaws in earlier versions of the Ethereum protocol. So, what happened was... Um, yeah, some dude created a lot, 19 million accounts that were empty and had nothing in them and it just sucked up a heap of space on everyone's hard drives and sucked up a heap of space on the network because they were processing these, um, if I can remember correctly, it wasn't free either. I think the dude spent like a couple thousand dollars on this, but this is when Ethereum was, actually to be honest, this is probably like the same October 2017. So this is actually probably before um, Ethereum mooned, but it probably still was thousands of dollars at that price, which it probably is like not very different to what the price is now. Um, just everyone's sad now because it crashed down to what it was last year. Um, so yeah, they created, spent thousands of dollars, I think, created all these empty accounts, spammed it up, and they made a lot of effort to check it. So in here, in part of this proposal, they added this line to say, if um, this is zero, see touch. And see touch, which is, I think we had that above, um, must go through it and check that it is slash touch. Um, journal append touch change address puts it into the dirty cache and when it's dirty it gets checked if it's nil so yeah that was added and that's what that's referring to they just want to make sure all the accounts are not empty subject balance is the opposite integer, subtract the balance, um, yeah, set balance, um, <laughs> this is always fun when you see these functions, because you're like, oh, if I just went into my balance and did set balance, instead of adding and subtracting, I could set my balance to a million Ethereum and I would be rich on my local account, but it'd be useless because it's not real money. But then Ethereum's not real money anyway, so who knows. Um, set balance internal. So this is where you got an internal and you got an external, and the difference is just this one capital letter. This does it safely, so everyone external can only do the safe stuff, whereas internally you can do whatever you want, really internal to the package, so all the functions of the package can call it, but all the external, like the main and the everyone else that would use this. Returns the gas back to the origin. It has nothing, it's an empty function. Deep copy, so without even digging into that, it's the same as um, I was talking about yesterday. They go through the object and they copy it, the state object. And instead of just like, yeah, the risk is with complex objects in any language is that the compiler tries to save space by instead of copying it and having two copies of this big complicated structure, it just references. So like in Excel, we go equals cell B2 instead of typing it in a second time. It's like the compiler likes doing that 
for big structures, which makes sense a lot of the time. But when you're doing stuff like this, you want copies. So um, explicitly saying you want this deep copy is a, something you have to make yourself. And it's you go through every single item in the object, the code, the day storage, the origin, suicide, blah. And you create this new function, um, new object. You're creating a new object, going through each item and copying them across individually. And these have got copies themselves. So that's a function called deep copy that calls another object within the object that has a copy in. And that's how much effort you have to put in to copy stuff safely. Because what ends up happening if you've got references is someone changes an old one and it fucks up your new one. And that's where you get weird errors because you can't debug why something's changed. And it turns out that a function on the side changed. It's called side effects. Like you've got side effects of your function when it's changing shit beneath you. And someone else's object gets changed and they're not very happy because someone's touching their crap. Um, address. Returns the address. Now, it kind of looks like we're getting straight into the the boring functions that are just there to, you've got an object, it's got a, it's got a data, a bit of data or something underneath it. Control Z. Um, escape. So getters and setters, called in every other language, they don't call them go because here in Java or something, they'd say get address and return the address. Whereas here, if you just had this um, data structure as an A, you'd be able to do it anyway. But they don't want that because that would mean you can change the address. They don't want people outside of the func uh, of the package changing shit on them. Um, code returns the contract code associated with this object, if any. So if the code is nil, return nothing. Yeah, then you return nil. Um, if it is equal to the empty code hash, return nil. Um, otherwise, go to the database, get the contract code. If there's an error, set an error. If not, return the code and set the code within it. So this doesn't just get the code. Um, in the state object, there is a the code is actually saved. But until someone actually needs to use it, it stays nil. Um, so if the code does not equal nil. So at some point, you might have already copied it in there. If you have, it'll return it straight away. If not, it'll actually go dig it out of the database. And this saves you from going into the database every single time because you're saving it in your local memory on the computer. Set code. So you've written some code that's been compiled down into Ethereum virtual machine bytecode. And all that means is that um, probably you probably only do this once at the very start creating it. It appends the code. You got the code and the code hash. Um, oh wait, no, it's saying previous code. So there's a chance that your code has been different. I didn't know you could update the code. I didn't think you could update a code in in a contract. <laughs> Who knows? Previous hash, previous code, code change. So this this sounds very much like you can change the code, doesn't it? Um. Actually, I'm pretty. I'm pretty confident when you write a contract on the Ethereum blockchain, once it's up there, you can't change it. You can change it in a like, if you make a reference to another bit of code in another contract, and then you make a new contract with different code in it, you can point it at a different contract. Um, 
which I guess would change the underlying code base. Yeah, that changes the underlying code base. So I guess it's possible. It's definitely possible. Um, set code, this flat out just puts it straight in the code. Again, small s, big s. If you do this, it goes through the journal for the database. I'm not sure what this journal exactly does right now. Um, with an accounting background, when I read journal to a database, journal into a ledger. Um, I'm just guessing it's a list of transactions that are yet to be formally committed to the database. Um, set code, in this case we just change it straight off. We said dirty code, because the code is dirty. Um, the code hash, you return the splice of the code hash. I think it just gives you more functions when it's a splice rather than an array. Set nonce, same deal. Um, there's going to be two here. Yep, set nonce, set nonce. This one flat out just puts it straight in there. This one goes through the journal. Um, your nonce is how many transactions that account has done. Code hash, this flat out just returns the code hash in the data structure. So state object has another object called data and in that data is the code hash which is this code hash here. They want you working with this state object rather than the underlying data. So they just say you can go into code hash, call code hash here. Same with balance, same with nonce. So you can set the nonce via the safe method. You can't set it via the unsafe method unless you're internal. And you got these getters. Get code hash, get balance, get nonce. Value, never called, but must be present to allow state object to be used as a VM account interface that also satisfies the VM contract ref. Ooh. Interface. Interfaces are awesome. Um, so I guess... Uh, da, 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 da. I guess somewhere in quit WQQ dot clear city VM. Is there a VM? Yep. Uh, CD VM. No. All right. Um, ACK dash I. Account. No, that's not going to be deep enough. I wonder if that stack has an interfaces are awesome. Uh, trees. Where's the virtual machine? It's in core. CD core. CD VM. Clear. Ellis. Is there any account contract? <laughs> Account. account ref, here we go. So in here, contract ref. Contract ref is an interface that has an address. So this definitely has, this state object definitely has an address. Contract ref, account interface. So you have to have an address. But I guess an object should have a value. Golang dot value? I wonder if that does anything. I 
think it might be a go thing. So I think that interfaces are awesome. Is it sarcasm? Ballad jump. So I guess the state object, they're trying to get it to be a contract reference so that they can call all these functions that they have for whatever contract ref is. Because they must call contract ref a lot. And a contract has an address and it has a value. Which I thought was a balance, to be honest. Reference to the contract's backing object. Ah. Which is this object, right? The state object. So the count ref has an address, common address, AR. So this is obviously, the, well not obviously, um, they're linking the contracts. When you have a contract in a higher level, to this is the contracts from a low level database. So this is what's saved in the database and what's played in it. So you need to reference what's in here by digging it out of here and they do that by saving this address which is a contract ref don't really know cool but it's interesting somehow this is linked to this um, and this requires this one to have a, um, a value not sure why. Anyway, that is the end of the state object. Shouldn't say that. Um, the state object source code. And I think this yellow paper has given me quite a good direction of what we should talk about because we kind of it's, it's gone a bit over state state objects it's gone to trees um, then the transaction we went through yesterday and the blocks we went through the day before so they start talking about transaction receipts here and that's probably a good place to look at tomorrow because that's right in this um, types as well clear Ellis um, receipt there's the receipt so that's a, probably a good place to look at tomorrow um, thanks for tuning in we'll see you tomorrow